Today's gospel contains that beautiful scene which Our Lady tells the waiter and through him each one of us to do whatever he tells you. Those great doctors of the church, uh, St. Augustine, St. Cyril of Alexandria, and the Venerable Bede all teach that our Lord was present at the wedding at Cana so that he might give his sanction to marriage and sanctify it by his presence. How we need to recall that in, that in these terrible times, that we need to do whatever he tells us, and our Lord has sanctified marriage. You don't need me to tell you that marriage is under serious attack. Here's the latest insanity from our beloved government. January 7th, 2011, quote, The words mother and father will be removed from U.S. passport applications and replaced with gender-neutral terminology, the State Department says. The words in the old form were mother and father, said Brenda Sprague, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Passport Services. They are now parent one and parent two. A statement on the State Department website noted that these improvements are being made, these improvements are being made, to provide a gender-neutral description of a child's parents and in recognition of different types of families. Sprague said that the decision to remove the traditional parenting names was not an act of political correctness. Close quote. Lying isn't a sin for our government workers either. The words in the old form were mother and father. They are now parent one and parent two in recognition of different types of families. But of course, this decision was not an act of political correctness. Well, none of this should come as a surprise. We've been on this trajectory for a very long time. And barring divine intervention, it's only going to get worse, a lot worse. We'll follow that line of thought another day. But we have some work to do before we get to that point. Let's get started. The obvious question that almost nobody in our society seems capable of giving a coherent answer to is, what is marriage? So for the sake of time, we'll follow Frank Sheed quite closely here. Marriage is a contract that results in a relationship. Marriage is a contract that results in a relationship. A man and a woman are free to marry or not marry. But if they make the agreement to marry, then God attaches certain consequences to their act. To this particular free choice of a man and a woman, God has attached the consequence that a real relationship comes into being. They have stated their will to be man and wife. God takes them at their word and makes them so. The man and woman make the agreement to marry. God makes the marriage. Their husband and wife, by their own consent, but by his act. They are now related to each other closer than a brother to a sister, closer than a father to his son, in a relationship made directly by God. As our Lord stated, they are no longer two, but one flesh, Matthew 19.6. Because their oneness is a god main thing, man cannot alter it. What God therefore has joined together, our Lord continues, let not man put asunder. God alone can bring a marriage into being. God alone lays down the conditions by which it can cease to be. Once this relationship is in being, the parties can't alter the conditions, nor can the state, nor can the church. By God's ordinance, marriage is the lifelong union of a man and a woman for the propagation of the species. Thus, marriage is not terminable as a contract would be terminable by the consent of the parties or by the will of the state. From this it follows that while the parties can separate, with the husband going to other women, the wife to other men, they are still husband and wife because it was God that made them so. Their ignoring of the oneness leaves the oneness untouched, is beyond their reach, beyond any reach but God's. Similarly, a declaration by the state that a husband and a wife are no longer husband and wife a declaration, that is, of divorce, is a mere form of words. 
The state can say that it has broken the marriage bond between the two people, but it has not broken it. During the lifetime of the parties, they remain husband and wife because that is of the nature of marriage as ordained by God. The failure to understand this teaching of the Catholic Church has given rise to much quite irrelevant argument. Those who urge that the Church should grant, or at any rate permit divorce, always do so on the ground that in certain cases it is desirable. But to urge that a thing is desirable is no answer to a statement that it is impossible, and that is the precise truth. Marriage, then, is a contract resulting in a relationship, or better still, it is a relationship resulting from a contract. For when the relationship comes into being, the contract has done its work. It has produced the relationship of marriage. And the parties are now governed in their common life not by the contract which they made, but by the relationship which God made in ratification of their contract. As a practical matter resulting from its being God-made, marriage is not indissoluble just because the parties at the wedding made vows of lifelong fidelity. It is indissoluble because it is marriage. Thank you, Frank Sheed. Marriage is not indissoluble just because the parties at their wedding made vows of lifelong fidelity. It is insoluble because it is marriage. Now, every one of the married couples here should have had everything we'll talk about this morning explained to you in great detail at your marriage preparation classes, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem that it's only the State Department that's gone into major malfunction mode. So given that marriage is indissoluble, today we're going to ask ourselves, according to the teaching of the Church, what are the grounds, if any, which permit a marriage couple to separate? What are the rules which would govern such regrettable situations? Okay? Unless otherwise noted, all the quotes which follow, they're all cut and pasted as usual, usual, are taken from various commentaries on marriage and canon law, but it's not an academic exercise. I'm not going to bother naming the texts. We'll start with Canon 1114 from the 1983 Code of Canon Law. It was the same in the old code, and I have commentaries before the code. The first code of canon law was in 1917, but before that there was plenty of canon law. It just hadn't been codified, and nothing has changed except minor details in what we're going to talk about today, Very nothing that, that impacts directly on what we're going to say. Canon 1141, a marriage which is ratified and consummated. Uh, ratified means that the vows have been validly exchanged, and consummated means that the marital act has taken place sometime after the exchange of vows. A marriage which has been ratified and consummated cannot be dissolved by any human power or by any cause other than death. This doctrine must be accepted on faith as part of the official teaching of the Church itself. Christ Church has always taught that marriage is not dissolved by adultery contrary to the claims of the Orthodox and Protestant churches. Thus has vindicated the true meaning of the principle, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Given that a ratified and consummated marriage is absolutely indissoluble except by the death of one of the parties, what are the obligations that flow from this indissolubility? Because marriage makes the spouses two in one flesh, they must share a common life. Canon law determines, in Canon 1151, spouses have the obligation and the right to maintain their common conjugal life unless a lawful reason excuses them. This means they must share a common bed, board, and dwelling. Close quotes. We continue, quote, By reason of illness, work, or other just causes, a temporary separation of the spouses may exist without suspending, however, the right and duty of the spouses to assist each other in other ways. This refers to cases like a soldier being deployed, a welder working on a pipeline far away from home uh, and having to leave his family in that way and so forth. It does not refer, uh, just cause does not refer to someone having a hissy fit and going back to their parents, uh, things like that. Back to the commentary. This is different from legal separation, which consists strictly of a legally declared suspension of the right and obligation to live together. By marriage, a couple owed each other mutual fidelity, mutual aid, both spiritual and material, and life in common. 
the spouses also commit themselves to the spiritual and material welfare of the children. Therefore, behavior on the part of either of the spouses, which would seriously harm any of these duties, would constitute sufficient grounds for separation. For this reason, there are four lawful causes for legal separation. A. Adultery. B. Serious bodily harm inflicted upon the spouse or children. C. Serious spiritual harm to the other spouse or the children. D. Desertion. Close quotes. So the four le- lawful causes for legal separation are adultery, serious bodily harm inflicted upon the spouse or the children, serious spiritual harm to their spouse or the children, and desertion. Now, before we move on, we have to explain these causes in a little bit more detail. We'll start with adultery. Quote, Adultery con- constitutes an act against the very nature of marriage by which the spouses become one flesh and is an injury to the innocent spouse. Consequently, it is sufficient ground for permanent separation, which, however, is not recommended. Furthermore, permanent separation requires the approval of the competent ecclesiastical authority. Close quote. So adultery is sufficient ground for a permanent separation, which is not recommended, but which must also be approved by the competent ecclesiastical authority. We'll address the issue of who the competent ecclesiastical authority is in a minute. But before that, since the sin of adultery has a lot broader meaning than the legal definition of adultery in the canon law, we'll make sure that we have a clear understanding of the legal definition. In order for adultery to be a canonical cause for separation, quote, first, it must be consciously committed and formally consummated. Gravely unchaste acts other than the marital act do not fit this legal definition. Second, there must be moral certitude that the adultery took place. Third, the other spouse must not have consented. Fourth, the other spouse must not have been responsible for it, for example, by desertion or frequent unreasonable denial of marital rights. Fifth, the adultery must not be mutual. And sixth, the adultery must not be condoned in any way. There is tacit condemnation when the innocent party, knowing of the adultery, has freely continued to treat the guilty one with marital affection. Condemnation is presumed unless the innocent party expels, deserts, or brings legal accusation against the adulterer within six months. So for adultery to be a lawful cause for legal separation, it must be consciously committed and formally consummated. There must be moral certainty that the adultery took place. The other spouse must not have consented. The other spouse must not have been responsible for it. The other spouse must not have also committed it, and it must not have been condoned. One last detail. Although the innocent party has the right to separate on his own authority, he or she is required within six months of that separation to initiate the procedures to have the separation formalized. Canon 1152, paragraph 3, quote, If the innocent spouse spontaneously severed conjugal living, that spouse, within six months, is to bring a suit for separation before the competent ecclesiastical authority. This authority, after having investigated all the circumstances, is to decide whether the innocent spouse can be induced to forgive the misdeed and not to prolong the separation permanently. Close quote. So now that we've covered that horrendous crime, let's turn to the other lawful causes for legal separation. Serious bodily harm afflicted upon the spouse or children, serious spiritual harm to the other spouse or children, and desertion. Canon law states that these are causes for temporary separation, and then when the situation is such that there would be danger and delay, then the spouse may separate under his own authority, and that, quote, when the reason for the separation ceases to exist, Conjugal living is to be restored unless ecclesiastical authority decides otherwise. Close quote. Basically, what it means is when the reason for the separation ends, then the separation has to end because they're married. Now let's turn to the question of ecclesiastical authority. Just who is a competent authority to authorize the legal separation of spouses? Canon 1692 answers this. We'll simply quote from a commentary on that canon. The authorization to separate is an act of jurisdiction reserved to the diocesan bishop. Neither pastors, nor priests, nor those employed by diocesan agencies as marriage counselors or other such capacities may authorize the separation of the spouses, not even temporarily, under the guise of pastoral or professional counseling. Close quote. That's worth pondering. I'll repeat it. The authorization to separate is an act of jurisdiction 
reserved to the diocesan bishop. Neither pastors, nor priests, nor those employed by diocesan agents as marriage counselors or other such capacities may authorize the separation of the spouses, not even temporarily, under the guise of pastoral or professional counseling. Uh, as the teaching of the Church with regards to justifiable causes for separation may, may very well be, and often is, a salvation issue for those who have entered into the married state, would it not seem reasonable to give engaged couples this information during their marriage preparation? But if the bishop is the only authority before God competent to authorize a separation, how is it that we've never heard this? Has anyone here ever heard of a bishop authorizing a separation? Is there some kind of loophole? Actually, there is. Quote, If the decisions of the ecclesiastical authority are not recognized by civil law, the local bishop may authorize the spouses to present their separation cases to a civil court. But this operation, authorization should never be granted if it is foreseeable that the civil court will decide in a manner that is contrary to divine law. As the legislation of the states favors divorce rather than separation by not providing sufficient protection to the legitimate interests of the parties seeking only a separation, the recourse to the civil courts raises grave pastoral and moral problems. Close quote. This is also really worth pondering. We'll repeat. If the decisions of the ecclesiastical authority are not recognized by the civil law, the local bishop may authorize the spouses to present their separation cases to a civil court. But this authorization should never be granted if it is foreseeable that the civil court will decide in a manner that is contrary to divine law. As the legislation of the states favors divorce rather than separation, just to pick, not exactly randomly, Texas, which has no provisions for legal separation. As the legislation of the states favors divorce rather than separation by not providing sufficient protection to the legitimate interests of the parties seeking only a separation, the recourse to the civil courts raises grave pastoral and moral problems. It certainly does. It certainly does. Those grave pastoral and moral problems are obvious to anyone with eyes to see. Consider the children. Quote, Children in post-divorce families do not, on the whole, look happier, healthier, better adjusted, even if one or both parents are happier. For the children, divorce is a life-transforming experience. National studies show that children from divorced and remarried families are more aggressive towards their parents and teachers. They experience more depression have more learning difficulties, and suffer from more problems than, with peers than children from intact families. Many of them end up in mental health clinics and hospital settings. Most children never really recover. The girls are more likely to seek out sex, the boys, drugs, and alcohol. There's earlier sexual activity, more children born out of wedlock, less marriage, less trust, fewer children overall, and more divorce. Numerous studies show that adult children of divorce have more psychological problems than those raised in intact marriages. In fact, a 2001 study found that adults whose parents had divorced when they were children were twice as likely to commit suicide than their peers from intact families. Close quote. Perhaps if the bishops over the past 40 years, perhaps if they had fought in the diocese and courts and legislatures, uh, for, for uh, against this Uniform Divorce Act, the way they fight the death penalty, which is certainly an issue that even faithful Catholics may have a difference of opinion. Perhaps if they had preached in season and out of season that a marriage which is ratified and consummated cannot be dissolved by any human power or any cause other than death. Perhaps had they been preaching and ordering their priests to preach in season and out of season, in a clear and unambiguous manner, 
Christ's teaching, his full teaching with regards to marriage, the beauty of the vocation, that it's a call to holiness for the man and woman who must be prepared to embrace the cross and to do whatever he tells you. And if they also preached, perhaps, the tough teachings, no divorce, the actual grounds for legal separation, the parameters of the marital act, and the intrinsic evil of contraception, then we wouldn't have these new kinds of marriage. We wouldn't have parent one and parent two on government forms. We wouldn't have the emotional wreckage from so many destroyed families, so many people wounded terribly, unbelievably. Most importantly, we wouldn't have what appears to be the eternal loss of so many immortal souls. But that hasn't happened. And so we need to pray. We need to pray and we need to act. We all know people that are struggling in their marriage. It's hard, almost impossible for some couples, and our divorce culture only makes the pressure to break up even worse. Since the courts aren't going to help them, since the legislatures aren't going to help them, since the executive branch certainly isn't going to help them, and since apparently most chanceries aren't prepared to help them, then we have to help them in every way we can with our prayers and encouragement. And that means encouragement. If the only one competent of judging a case is a diocesan bishop, since none of us here are diocesan bishops, we better be careful not to judge the cases. We weren't in their skin. We don't know what happened there. We have to help them with our love and our prayer and our support in every way we can and not get all uppity because there but for the grace of God go any one of us. We'll close with a letter received by a priest at Christmas. Dear Father, I'm eternally grateful to you for advising me not to leave my husband because, as you said, the salvation of my soul and his soul may depend on my staying with him. My husband left the church and became an atheist in the mid-80s. He was my own persecutor in the practice of the Catholic faith, and it was a terrible persecution indeed. In November 2009, he developed a cough that wouldn't go away. After numerous biopsies, he was diagnosed with lung cancer and given six months to a year to live. His condition rapidly deteriorated. He became very short of breath, had extreme fatigue, loss of weight, inability to eat, etc., etc. Father X came to our home on March 24th. My husband sent him away. The following day, he asked to be taken to the hospital when he could not breathe despite an increase in his oxygen. On this day, Father Y came to see him. But one of our two daughters barred him from getting near my husband because of his dying wish that he not want a priest or any religious services when he died. By this time, he was on a continuous morphine drip. Whenever he was lucid, I would tell him that he had nothing to lose but everything to gain if we would let the priest come to give him the anointing of the sick. I told him repeatedly that I believe in heaven and hell, that there is a life after death, and that I want to be with him in heaven. I put a brown scapular on him, the green scapular, the miraculous metal on his bed sheet. I blessed him with salt and holy water often. A friend and I prayed the divine mercy chaplet, the rosary, the three beautiful prayers from the Pieta book, Novenus to St. Joseph and St. Jude, and had masses offered for him. He finally consented for the priest to come. Our daughters had to verify this from him before they let the priest in. Father X administered the last rites on March 28th, Palm Sunday. My husband received the apostolic blessing. On Holy Thursday, April 1st, he started taking his last breaths at 11.20 p.m., and he died at 2.20 a.m. on Good Friday. 
the most peaceful death. He shared in our Lord's agony on the cross for three hours, and I relate his sufferings to St. Dismas when St. Dismas asked Jesus to remember in paradise. He had a Catholic burial service and is buried in a Catholic cemetery. Close quote. From all eternity, God saw that this man was going to arrogantly reject him, arrogantly reject the true faith, and then torment and persecute his poor wife. God saw that. God saw all that. He saw the decades, literally decades of pain and suffering she was going to receive at the hands of her husband. And he also saw that not only would this suffering sanctify her if she let it, God saw that if she remained faithful to her end, all her suffering, all her prayers and sacrifices would finally win the grace for her husband to return to the faith and die with the benefit of the sacraments. God saw that from eternity. But suppose she had left him. Suppose she had thrown off the cross and left her husband. Without her prayers and assistance, where would he certainly have gone when he died? He would have been damned. Damned for all eternity. And then when her time arrived to appear before the judgment seat of our Lord, what would our Lord have said to her? What are you doing here? Where is your husband? Did you not know, once you took that vow at the altar, that his salvation was wrapped up with yours? Did you not know that? And all it took was a little kindness and encouragement from one man for her to keep bearing the cross. She was faithful. She kept her post. And now perhaps her husband is already thanking the Lord for such a good and faithful wife. Looking forward to that day when he will be able to greet her once again and say, because of you, I have eternal life. <laughs>